blessing it was. And, uh, but with that, you guys ready? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to praise you, to worship you, how great you are. And I ask for your help for me to rightly minister your word and your greatness tonight as we look at Daniel chapter 2, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is where we are going in Daniel chapter 2. Tonight we are going to the end game. We're going to have this dream. Nebuchadnezzar had the dream. Remember where we left off? Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. Uh, He says he's going to lop off everybody's head. He's going to chop them into pieces if they can't tell him his dream. And then the interpretation of the dream. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, was a smart guy. He knew anybody could tell him an interpretation if he told him what the dream was. He said, hey, if you uh, soothsayers, if you magicians, if you psychics are really worth your salt, then you'll be able to tell me what I dreamed. If you can tell me what I dreamed, then I know I can believe your interpretation. So that's where we left off. He started killing the folks and, uh, who were not telling him what his dream was. In steps Daniel, and Daniel says, hey, I think I can tell you the dream because God in heaven is going to reveal it to me. But this is how God works. He tells us ahead of time what is coming, doesn't he? In fact, in the book of Isaiah, God tells us the end from the beginning. So we can know what we ought to do, so Israel can know what they ought to do. The Bible also teaches us that. There are hundreds, over 800 signs regarding the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we can look at events like today And we can understand things we read in Daniel, things we read in Revelation, Isaiah, Ezekiel, the Olive Discourse, throughout the Bible, and we can make sense of these things. Um, We have this, a big tech plan, social scores, human era ending. Uh, You know the social scores in China, we've talked a lot about that, right? Uh, So big tech, Google, Facebook, planning social scores. If you are not nice, if you don't go along with the uh, the, the uh, narrative of the globalist agenda, which we'll really get into over the next two Sundays, um, then I imagine your social score is going to come down. This is very prophetic regarding the last days and the direction that this world, the Bible tells us things are going to go, and we even start to get the direction on that tonight from the book of Daniel. Then there's this. Silicon Valley is building a communist-style social credit system. Same thing. Uh, Then this is alarming to some people. Uh, Trump administration considering a social credit score system to determine who can buy a gun. So we see the gun violence, and okay, how are we going to start controlling these things? And you have a social credit system. I don't know where that's gone since this was first reported last week, but you'll look at these things, and I can promise you, A social credit system is coming to this world, and there's going to be a database. And uh, we already know Google, you just saw it. Uh, The tech industry is is developed the system. And we know from Revelation chapter 13, it will be implemented. We also can tell from Daniel chapter 2 the direction this is going to go. Uh, Then there's this, the push to kill cash. Next up, Australia. Will there be a cashless society? Yes because you will not be able to buy or sell unless you receive the mark of the beast. So as Daniel was able to tell the dream to Nebuchadnezzar and then interpret it, and we're going to get to the interpretation in just a few minutes, so too we have the various visions that prophets were given throughout the Bible of what it's going to be like in the last days, and we can go, aha, wait, the Bible says this, this, and that. We look at these things and we go, hmm, is this just a quinky dink? There's this. Bishop Schneider says the Vatican is betraying Jesus Christ as the only Savior of mankind. Let me read this first sentence, first paragraph to you. The Vatican's decision to implement a document affirming that the diversity of religions is willed by God. Did you get that? The diversity of religions is willed by God. Without correcting this statement is tantamount to promoting the neglect of the first commandment and the betrayal of the gospel, says uh, Bishop Schneider. Um, I, I mentioned this to you before, that uh, in there, there's a book out. Um, in fact, I think it was last time I told you about this, a book called The Keys to This Blood, and it was a, um, a Jesuit priest, Father Malachi Martin, who had written this, and he said, listen, the 
Vatican at its core is corrupt. They don't believe in the virgin birth. They don't believe in the deity of Christ. And this is what this bishop is saying. Here's what is coming. Malachi Martin warned of it some 40 years ago, and he said, this is underlined, and this is what is happening. We looked a little bit at that last time. So we see this, it's, it's, and it's getting away from Jesus Christ. It's getting away from God. Things must go this way. Then there's this. Iran vows extraordinarily significant nuclear move that is coming. Have you been paying attention to the Iran stuff over the last couple of days? Yeah, this is uh, just a couple hours ago. Um, I'll read this to you. Trump ramps up tension. President suggests the U.S. is locked and loaded against attackers of Saudi oil as Iran faces the blame. And we're having this war and rumor of war. And this thing is huge, by the way. It is enormous. Damage from Iran-linked drone attack on Saudi oil facility is captured in satellite images. Defiant Iran blasts Pompeo's Saudi attack accusations as being blind and futile comments. So we're watching this. We're watching the wars and rumors of wars and all the various things that are taking place. Uh, but yet the Bible said, as it was in the days of Daniel, here's the dream, here's the interpretation. That's just a portion of it. And we have so many other prophecies. Then there's this, and then we'll get on with Daniel. Uh, Quaylen Noor on San Francisco declaring NRA a domestic terror organization. Anybody hear about that? All right. Americans should be worried. What did he say? Americans should be worried about this declaration of San Francisco that the NRA's domestic terrorist group, a gun rights advocate, Colin Noor, told Tucker Carlson, what's the end goal here? Now, this is what you need to listen to. This guy's sharp. What's the end goal here? He asked, uh, was asked on Tucker Carlson. And they said this, this is quoting him. We are talking about an organization that has 5 million people who are American citizens. So what are we going to do? Are we going to start rounding them up and throwing them in prison also? Uh, this is, uh, the, the reason I bring this up to you is because this should alarm you. As it was in the days of Nazi Germany, everything, you can see these things going this way. If you, you fall into a, a political or religious agenda that does not fit this globalist viewpoint that uh, Jesus is not God, you can't worship the God of the Bible. Um, listen, everything's going this way. And I'm going to tell you this too. Uh, as it was in the days of Nazi Germany, it was first the attacks against the Jews. And uh, this time it looks to me like the attack is coming against Bible believers. Uh, and then uh, the, the full attention will be turned to the Jews. You and I can already watch we are watching what's happening here in America as um, what's going on with the Jews. If you say, uh, I mean, th th we have three congresswomen who uh, just are pressing forward and labeling everything Jewish and everything Israel as being apartheid state and evil and wicked and even calling Jews Nazis. That's just the most ridiculous thing when it's the Nazis who are killing the Jews. But we're watching these things go this direction. This should alarm you. And he knows he's smart. And once you label anybody in the NRA as a terrorist, then that gives the government the authority to be able to round them up and arrest them. That hasn't happened yet. But this is what they're proposing in San Francisco. Uh, so we, nevertheless, as we put things, we take what the Bible says and the end game, right? We can see the direction all of this is going. So let's look at this. Uh, Daniel chapter 2, picking up where we left off last time. Where we left off last time, Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar, already mentioned it, Neb, I've got, uh, God's going to give me the dream and the interpretation. Stop killing people, right? Remember that? Okay, chapter 2, verse 28 of Daniel. There is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And he has made known to you, King Nebuchadnezzar, what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. Here's what was in your head, and now I'll give you the interpretation. As for you, verse 29, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. 
And he who reveals secrets has made to you, known to you what will be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living. But for our sakes, who make known the interpretation to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your heart, you, O king, were watching. And behold, a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you, and its form was awesome. Now imagine Nebuchadnezzar is listening to Daniel tell him this. I imagine his knees start shaking. He's going, this is what I saw. He's really telling me what I saw. So he knows what he's going to hear is the truth. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. The iron and the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff. Poof! They came like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. Wow, let's stop here for a few minutes. And, uh, uh, we note the first thing. Daniel tells the king what he has dreamed. Verse 28 He identifies it. God of heaven has told you, he's given you a dream and this vision for what will take place, verse 28, in the latter days. From here now, all the way through to the very end, that is what your dream is concerning. This dream takes us right up to where I believe we are living today. And as Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar what his dream was, Once again, Nebuchadnezzar sees this towering image over him. And verse 31 says, and its form was awesome. I love that. And Nebuchadnezzar's going, oh, you better believe it was awesome. Verse 37, you, O king, are a king of kings. Notice how it does not say, are the king of kings. You are a king king of kings. In fact, as far as the kings go, you're pretty awesome of this earth. You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, Then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, this kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay, partly of iron, the kingdom, that kingdom, shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days, verse 44, of these kings, The God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. And as much as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. This dream is certain and its interpretation is true. Wow! Guess what, Nebuchadnezzar? This is how it's all going to unfold until Jesus comes. So here's a picture of uh, the, um, a drawing of the dream, the statue 
that Nebuchadnezzar has. You have the head of gold, which is the Babylonian Empire. We're going to break these down for you in just a minute. You have the, the chest and the arms, which are silver, Medo-Persian Empire. Uh, then you have the bronze, belly and thighs. That's the Greek Empire. You have the legs of iron. You know what that is, right? Roman Empire. And then you have the feet and the toes. What are they? The ten toes, partly iron, partly clay. That is the revived Roman Empire. Uh, so, real brief, verse 32 and 33, head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, feet is a mixture of iron and clay. So as we look at these different metals, the first thing that we notice is the decrease in the value of the metals. So it begins at the top. What is it? It's gold is at the top. Uh, gold is the most valuable out of all of them. So it begins with gold and it decreases in value all the way down to the very end, iron mixed with clay. Um, gold is the most valuable, but out of all of these metals, gold is also the softest. So we have the decrease in the value of the metals as it goes from top to the bottom, but we also have the increase in the strength of the metals as it goes from the top to the bottom. As gold is soft, each of the metals, although they decrease in value, they increase in their hardness. The last of which is the legs of iron, except when you get to the final coming kingdom, the ten toes with clay and iron. That is this revived Roman Empire that is coming. Revelation chapter 17 even tells us we have ten kings that are ruling this globalist empire and they give their power and authority to the beast, a.k.a. the Antichrist. Then Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar, while you were watching, verse 34, the statue that you saw was pulverized. A stone cut without hands struck the feet of iron and clay and broke them all in pieces. Every kingdom represented in this statue is pulverized every kingdom of man is crushed to nothing verse 35 says they became like chaff the stone that struck the feet it grew and grew until it covered the whole earth you might think okay you have this great big statue it might be like david and goliath where this stone is launched and the statue falls over not so Nebuchadnezzar finds out, and you and I find out, and anybody who reads this, this is what happens. That stone that is cut without hands, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he comes, he's not just toppling the statues of the world empires over. He's not just moving them to the side. He is crushing them to the place where they are blown away like chaff. And the empire that is coming, the ultimate new world order, you know what that is? That is when Jesus returns. The Antichrist and the false prophet, they have that new world order during the seven-year tribulation period. That's not going to be a very long time. That is the ten toes and the ten that are with the iron and the clay. But after that, in comes Jesus. He's coming back through the valley of Megiddo. He's riding on his horse. And guess what? We're riding with him. And I can't wait. I was with Don Perkins last week on this, at this prophecy thing. And he goes, man, I, I'm going to be on one of those horses. I already got a name for my horse. He called it Nelly. I said, I said, I don't know why he called it Nelly, but he did. Uh, I, you know, but nevertheless, we are, I, not a bad idea to pick a name for my horse now. And we are going, and we're going to rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to settle in Jerusalem, and he's going to subdue all kingdoms to himself. That is what is going on here. Verse 36, Daniel says, now I'm going to tell you the interpretation. So Daniel informs the king how it's all going to end. Look at this again, verse 37 to 38. You, O king, are the, a king of kings, for the God of heaven, look at this, the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or, and the birds of the heaven, God, the God of heaven, look at that, He has given them into your hand, and has made you, you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. Um, he tells them 
this is the direction it is going to go. Again, not unlike where we are today, but even more so where we are today. Because now we have the written word. We don't just have Daniel chapter 2. We have the various chapters of the book of Daniel and the prophets of the Old Testament and the writers of the New Testament and the book of Revelation. So again, we can see how this whole thing is going to unfold. So again, wake up, Christian. Connect the dots. We look at this. This is what this says. Did you see this? California Dem laments presence of God in congressional oaths is just preposterous. Uh, I read this article it, to, to make sure I got it. It wasn't just a misleading title. You look at this and you go, this is what was really said. This is preposterous. God in our oaths, this is what Daniel is warning about. The day is coming when God, the great God of heaven, is going to be removed from everything. It's going to happen. Ultimately, this is what happens with the final world empire with the ten toes and the Antichrist at the top claiming to be the Christ, worship him, got to remove any thought of the God of the Bible from this world. So things are going that way. And by the way, this isn't just affecting California. This stuff is all over the map. You look at Washington, D.C. right now, it's, 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 it's a mess. Uh, another thing is we have the boycott Israel. So as the world is saying, let's boycott Israel, right? That's a sign. Zechariah chapter 12, the world is going to go against Israel. Boycott all things Israel. At the same time, over in Israel, you want to know what they're doing right now? They're looking for the Messiah. Check this out. Urushiva. Arab states condemning Hezbollah sounds like messianic times. When could that possibly happen? There's this. Netanyahu promises Jewish prayer on Temple Mount before the Messiah comes. But the security minister says, sooner than that. You look at, there are people in Israel more and more all the time they're saying, we want the Messiah to come. Um, there's this uh, also out of Rusheva. U.S. considering including Jerusalem, Israel on passports. Did you know that's not allowed yet? So you look at all of this talk about Jerusalem, all of this talk about Israel, and you see, okay, you have the, the world against Israel, but at the same time, Israel looking for their Messiah. Uh, we have the various things that are taking place. Then you have this. The European Union, this is out of Gatestone, uh, a massive expansion of top-down um, powers. The European Union is attempting to structure itself right now in a way to become this great European state that wants to govern the world. And it's fascinating to watch because what you see coming out of Europe right now looks like two feet. It's got some iron in it mixed with a whole bunch of clay. It's all messed up. But we're watching this, and, and all of these things point to, they help us understand that the prophecies of the Bible will be fulfilled. And is this a fulfillment? I, I, I don't think that is a fulfillment, but we can see the direction that things are going. We can see the Jews wanting the Messiah more and more. Uh, we can see the pressure against Israel more and more. We can see all of these things coming together exactly as the Bible told us they would. Uh, in this, uh, we know, let's go back to this and get a few details. The first kingdom in this statue, this, this dream that Nebuchadnezzar has, is the kingdom of Babylon represented by uh, the gold head. Daniel had mentioned that you, Nebuchadnezzar, are awesome. You're this head of gold, right? So this goes to the king's joy. He's excited. You are the head of gold. Isn't that fantastic? And also note, where we just read it, verse 37 and 38. It is the God of heaven who appointed you as king, Nebuchadnezzar. It's even the God, even in verse 37, it's even the God of heaven who gave you the kingdom, power, strength, and glory, wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the air. He has given them into your hand. God has given you those things. We see this reiterated in Romans chapter 13. There's no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God, for they are God's ministers. So you look at this and you go, okay, God is sovereign. Is God sovereign? God is sovereign, so he's appointed. So people complain about our president. Well, guess what? He's there, and I believe God put him there. Uh, other people complained about the president before. Guess what? God put him there, too. Uh, and other people complained about the president before. 
Hey, they've been doing this for decades and centuries now in this country, in this world. It's always been this way. It did it in the days of Nebuchadnezzar. I'm sure some of the Jewish boys, when they were kidnapped by Babylon and taken over to Babylon, were not thinking, well, I just love Nebuchadnezzar. I'm sure a few of them were complaining along the way. So we have the king's joy. of you. God's appointed you here. You're pretty awesome. You're the head of gold. We also have the king's terror. Verse 39, after you shall arise another kingdom. Wow, what do you mean another kingdom? And then another kingdom, and then another kingdom. You know what this is? This is a reminder that all good things come to an end. And all bad things come to an end too. But Jesus said this in Luke chapter 12, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, ah, I know what I'm going to do. I'm a businessman. I will pull down my barns because they're too small, and I will build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Woohoo! Uh, take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? Elsewhere, Jesus said, what good does it do if a man gains the whole world and loses his own soul? If I could encourage this church, anybody watching by video, Sunday night, all three services, Sunday morning, is to understand this, that we are going to die. Do all that you can for the kingdom of Christ now. Because on that day, if you don't, you're going to regret it. And I can tell you this much, I'll probably harp on this more and more and more. I don't want to be accountable to God for not warning you. Uh, 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 and I'm going to tell you, we are going to be, if you're, if you're a believer, you're going to be in the presence of the Lord one day. I exhort you to do all that you can to live for Christ now. And that affects, I'm going to tell you something, it affects every area of our life. But um, what good does it do to gain the whole world and lose your own soul? I found a couple of quotes Here's, here's this one. Uh, whatever you lose, lose not your soul, said John Wesley. Um, and Spurgeon said, this, this is strong. A golden coffin will be a poor compensation for a damned soul. Nebuchadnezzar, God has appointed you king. Later on, we're going to see Nebuchadnezzar is going to say, the great Babylon I have built, and then God's going to humble him to prove God empowered him. Um, note the words, but after you, King Nebuchadnezzar, and then Daniel takes us on a journey uh, through time to the end game. We'll do this pretty quick. Um, <clears throat> so the first kingdom is Babylon. The second kingdom is Persia. Uh, Persia uh, would be better known as the Medo-Persian Empire. Um, Hence, you have in the statue, you have the chest of silver and you have two arms, right? A left arm and a right arm. You have the Medo-Persian Empire. Uh, one of the kings of Babylon that we're going to learn about later in the book of Daniel is Darius the Mede. Uh, Darius the Mede is the one who had Daniel thrown into the lion's den. Um, how could Darius the Mede be in the Persian Empire and this Mede be a king of Babylon? Because it was the Medo-Persian Empire it was combined at that time. Hence, again, one chest, but two arms. Notice here's something that's interesting. Um, you had the head of gold, power and strength, or, or power that Nebuchadnezzar had. He had absolute power, head of gold. But the Silver Kingdom, the Medo-Persian Empire, was inferior to the gold head, right? Think of this. When Nebuchadnezzar was in power, he had absolute sovereignty over all of his kingdom, including when he told his nobles, if you don't tell me my dream, I will cut you in pieces. Darius the Mede did not have that same power. When Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, again, we'll get there, 
Darius the Mede could not change the law, although he wanted to. He did not have the power that Nebuchadnezzar had. Also note this. Darius the Mede required conquered nations to pay tribute in silver. A coincidence that on the statue, a statue with silver chest and, and uh, the two arms for the Medo-Persian Empire. And, 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 and by the way, notice this for special interest today. The Kurds in northern Iraq are said to be the modern-day descendants of the ancient Medes. Uh, here's a map for you. I'm not going to leave it up here for more than a few seconds, but you see the yellow dot. You can go online and check it. People at home are seeing it right now, but you can go online and check it, and uh, you can pause it, take pictures of it, but all the yellow dots are where the Medes are scattered today, but you see, I don't know if this is going to work. You see down here, this is northern Iraq right here, and you'll look at it, and uh, just a, a point of interest. Uh, so we have the first kingdom is Babylon, second Persia, third kingdom is Greece. This kingdom is inferior to the silver kingdom as it is seen as the belly and thighs of bronze or brass. Note that the bronze is less valuable than gold and less valuable than silver, but the bronze or brass is a stronger metal. Gold is the softest, silver next, but the bronze or brass is stronger than the previous metals. As we continue through the book of Daniel, Oh, something that alarms critics is Daniel's accuracy in describing Alexander the Great and the Greek Empire and the empires that were coming, including the Medo-Persian Empire and the Roman Empire. It alarms um, critics so much that they say there's no way Daniel was written before these kingdoms came to be. Had to be written after. We'll see that. Um, no, God tells us the end from the beginning so that we can know and so that we can have an understanding. Um, also note in verse 39, this empire, the Greek empire, of bronze or brass, is to rule over all the earth. The Bible doesn't say that about the second kingdom, but it says it about the third kingdom. At the age of 33, while sitting on the banks of the Euphrates River, Alexander the Great wept, because he had no more worlds to conquer. Can you imagine that? Do you know any 33-year-olds? I mean, think of that. Be, there's no more worlds to conquer at the age of 33. Mark Zuckerberg became the youngest billionaire at 23. Um, recently, Kylie Jenner beat him, became the youngest billionaire at 21. Those are remarkable things. You hear those things. But Alexander the Great conquered the known world at the age of 33 and wept because there was nothing else that he could do. Note this too. As silver was the metal of the Medo-Persian Empire, bronze was the metal of Alexander the Great. In their weapons of war to conquer the world, they used bronze. And you have, what, a belly of bronze and two thighs, right? So uh, uh, although Alexander the Great left his empire to four generals, which comes up later in, in Daniel, only two of those generals became powerful. Uh, the two th represented by the two thighs. The empire of Syria run by the Seleucid dynasty and the empire of Egypt run by the Ptolemies. Um, we'll get into more detail of Alexander the Great later on. It'll, it'll be a while still. Uh, but um, I, I want to move on to the next kingdom because this one to me is so fascinating with where we are today. Um, we go back here, we see there's a head of gold. We have the Medo-Persian Empire, the silver, the bronze, the Greek Empire, and then the Roman Empire, the legs of iron, which is the fourth kingdom. Um, the two legs of iron are indicative of Rome crushing and shattering that are brought to every nation that it conquered. It even tells us here in verse 40, it will break in pieces and crush all the others. There was no empire in history that crushed all of its enemies as Rome did. Uh, with that, when Augustus established the empire in 30 BC, he called it the Pax Romana, or the Roman peace, since all known enemies of Rome had been crushed by their power. But I want you to think of this, and I'm going to leave you hanging here in just a minute. Uh, there's two legs, right? Roman Empire, 
Um, the two legs represent, according to world history, the east and the west divisions of Rome. In 330 AD, the Roman Empire, uh, Emperor Constantine dedicated the eastern capital, Constantinople, for the purpose of appeasing the eastern section of the Roman Empire. This is fascinating, because was, did the Antichrist rise out of, is he going to rise out of the western revived Roman Empire, or the eastern revived Roman Empire? This is what it comes down to. We have two legs of, of Rome, of the Roman Empire. But in 395 AD, 65 years later, between the east and west, things had grown worse for the Roman Empire and Theodosius, recognizing the obvious that the east and west of the Roman Empire had clearly developed into two different empires, divided the Roman Empire between his two sons. Hence, there is the eastern empire known as the Byzantine. Um, and, and in fact, when you go to Israel, the Byzantine Empire appears a lot in some of the historic sites that you go to. Uh, Caesarea by the sea is one of those. The western part of the Roman Empire was governed in Rome. The eastern part was governed in what was then known as Constantinople. Now it is known as Istanbul. Um, th there's a lot I want to say on this, so I'm going to wait. Uh, and I haven't decided yet what I'm going to do with this. Uh, I want to take two Sunday nights, next Sunday night and the Sunday after that, talk about two things. Is the Antichrist coming out of the Eastern Roman Empire or the Western Roman Empire? There are some say he's going to rise out of the Eastern Roman Empire, so the Antichrist is Muslim. I want to deal with that. There's others say, no, he's going to rise out of the Western leg of the Roman Empire. So I'm going to look at both of those things. I also want to get here, because we're not going to be able to get here tonight. I want to look at the ten toes, or the ten kings, this kingdom that's still coming. It's still coming. How do we know it's still coming? I'm going to show you right now, all right? Turn in your Bibles, all the way, about three pages, to Daniel chapter 9. And look at this. We're going to connect this. This is a prophecy you've heard before. If you follow Bible prophecy at all, if you come here on Sunday nights, you know it. But we're going to look at it because it starts to play in here, and then we're going to conclude here in just a minute. You know why we're going to conclude in just a minute? Because there's hamburgers out there, and I'm hungry, that's why. <laughs> I'm kidding. I've kept you late so many times, I'm going to actually let you out on time. Uh, chapter 9, verse 24. Daniel has his vision. Angel Gabriel's going to give him his vision, his understanding. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, Gabriel tells Daniel, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. Who's your people? The Jews, right? Your holy city, Jerusalem, right? All Bible prophecy ultimately has the bullseye as Jerusalem and the Jewish people. That's why I talk about this so much. Um, what for? To finish the transgression, make an end of sins, make reconciliation for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, that happened during the time of Nehemiah. When Nehemiah is told, go and, and, and build a wall around the city, right? From that command to restore and build Jerusalem, until the Messiah, the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Uh, these weeks, we've seen this before, each week is a period of seven years. So it's talking about, when you multiply it out, 483 years. So it'll be exactly 483 years from the time of the command Nehemiah is told to, to build Jerusalem, restore it, and the time when Jesus would ride into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. It'd be exactly 483 years by Babylonian, by the Babylonian calendar. The street will be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. That describes the days of Nehemiah, troublesome times. And then after the 62 weeks, or the 7 plus 62, after after the 69 weeks or the 483 years, the Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. Who's the Messiah? He's crucified after the 483 years, right? Then what happens? And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Um, who destroyed the city? Of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. Who was it that destroyed Jerusalem? It was the Roman Empire, right? And so this is where prophecy scholars say 
Well, it was either the western leg of the Roman Empire or it was the eastern leg of the Roman Empire. So we're going to get into that. But what he says here, the people of the prince who is to come. He projects into the future, there's a prince coming out of those people who destroyed the city. So out of a revived Roman Empire, the ten toes that are mixed with iron and clay, out of this revived Roman Empire and the feet, is going to come this prince. And what's he going to do? Until the end of war and uh, uh, of the war desolations are determined. Desolations have been determined against the Jewish people uh, as far back as you can go in history. And then he, this is the antichrist, shall confirm a covenant with many for one week for 7 for 7 years. Uh, this, that, it's the 70th week of Daniel. That's what this is. The time when God is dealing with Jews. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offerings. And on the wing of abominations uh, shall be one who makes desolate. That Jesus talked about Matthew 24, verse 15, the abomination of desolation. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, when the Antichrist sits in the temple, demands to be worshipped as God. But there's a covenant. He's going to confirm a covenant with many for seven years in the middle of it at the three and a half year period he's going to break his covenant bible scholars will tell you this is speaking of a covenant of peace for jerusalem um i want you to think of this and, and don't throw things at me all right how many of you are republican you don't have to raise your hand just don't throw anything at me all right so here's this ministerial uh, to promote a future of peace and security in the Middle East. Um, I, I, I found this going on for years, this term peace and security, peace and security, peace and safety. When Condoleezza Rice and George Bush were, were running this thing, it was the same thing. John Kerry, it was the same thing during the Obama administration. Now with Trump and his son-in-law uh, Kushner, peace and security in the Middle East. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, when they say peace and safety, look out, then sudden destruction. First Thessalonians. Chapter 5, peace and safety or peace and security. So this idea, it's there. It's in the Bible. It's part of the last days. So we have this Trump plan to bring in a covenant of peace in Jerusalem. You see how this all fits? Then there's this, coming out of Ynet, out of Israel. There might be something to the deal of the century after all. You know, you'll look at these things. And... and uh, I am not saying that Donald Trump is the Antichrist. I'm going to tell you this, though. The world is clamoring and pushing for a peace plan for Israel. We know from Isaiah chapter 28 that the leaders in Jerusalem, when this covenant is confirmed, are going to do it because they want to, Isaiah 28 says, avoid a scourge that is coming their way. To avoid the scourge, God says you enter into a covenant with Shul, a covenant with death, and then God says, guess what? I'm going to annul that. Daniel tells us at the middle of the seven-year period, the Antichrist is going to annul it. God's the sovereign one. But all of this is coming, and ultimately, when that peace covenant is annulled, it is going to turn the hearts of the Jewish people to the Lord God, and they are going to worship Him as the Messiah. And you want to know what's going to happen then? This, when you see these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. This is what's going to happen. The Antichrist will finish out his seven years. Jesus is coming back. We already talked about this, didn't we? Did you name your horse yet? He's coming back. We are coming with him into the Valley of Megiddo, right over to the Mount of Olives. He's going to step on the Mount of Olives. Mount of Olives is going to split in two. Jesus is going to rule and reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years, and we are going to rule and reign with him, and he is going to crush all of these world empires. That's what the dream of Nebuchadnezzar is about. Next Sunday night, and the, the next two Sunday nights, I don't know which order yet. We're going to deal with does the Antichrist come out of Eastern or Western Roman Empire revived? And we're also going to deal with the subject of the ten toes uh, of this whole revived Roman Empire because it is fascinating as you look at this new world order. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your ministering. We pray for your glory. Help us to remember this isn't just about coming and hearing these things and getting excited, but we have the message of truth. 
You give us the prophetic word in advance so when we can read it, we can know that your word is true and we have the gospel of Jesus because there's a world of people who need to know Jesus Christ and that you love them and that Jesus has come to forgive us of our sins for anybody who would repent and believe in him. Lord, we thank you, but help us to be faithful, to occupy, and to be faithful to you until Jesus comes for us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You ready?